let's go ahead and get started. Maybe we won't have to keep y'all long tonight. <laughs> Not, All right, we're going to get started. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody, tonight that's, that's here in person and those that are streaming. We're glad you're, you're joining us back to study the same chapter of Matthew, but we're glad you're here and hope you're ready to participate and engage with us again as usual and, and have another good class. Um, before we get started, good morning. Those of you that have been in class for most of the quarter know Dave and I have some fun back and forth, and y'all know about the pawpaw thing, his nickname for me. But, uh, because it, he's it, old. It was in love, but, but uh, you know, sometimes I have to return the favor. And, and I've always commented that this is Dave's, you know, one of my favorite shirts that he wears. You know, I, he keeps it on the charger at home. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> But I kind of make fun of it. So in light of the events of this week, I want y'all to guess what this is. <laughs> Any guesses? <laughs> a lunatic eclipse. Sometimes words hurt, Robert Bobo. <laughs> oh. oh. You've got him fat shaming me now. So I've got to get This is uncalled you, for. Y'all better go down tonight. When they do the invitation, both y'all, down there. I'll be waiting on you. Oh. All right. Thanks for, for hearing our little, little joke tonight. We didn't plan that, by the way, but uh, I thought it was pretty good myself. <laughs> And I'm going to be out next week, by the way, so <laughs> he won't have an opportunity to return. But he doesn't forget either. So. <laughs> That's the truth. That's the honest truth there. All right, before we get started with our study, uh, let's open with a prayer. Are those that we need to remember tonight? Any specific or special updates? Yeah. Is there an afternoon update on Clay? Last I heard was they closed his chest today. Uh, has anybody heard any? Anything new on other than that? That's the last one. <clears throat> last I know. But it was successful, uh, positive outlook. So we're very encouraged and very thankful for that. Others? Yes, Sherry. Sherry, you said McCutcheon. She is almost finished, isn't she? And she still can't talk well. And so she's probably going to um, not be able to go back to work. Yeah. She's going to go Okay. Others? All right, if you would bow with me, let's go to God in prayer. God, our Father in heaven, we love you. Father, we give you all thanks and praise. We're grateful for this day of life. We're thankful, Father, for every blessing that we've enjoyed in this day throughout our lives. Father, we thank you for the rich physical blessings that we enjoy in this part of the world, in this community that we live in. We thank you most of all for the spiritual blessings that we enjoy through Christ and the sacrifice that was made to make that possible. We thank you, Father, for that hope that we have. Father, we're thankful for our family here at Madison. Pray that you'd continue to watch over and, and bless us and guide us. We pray that you would continue to provide growth and help us to, to be good stewards of every blessing you give us in sharing your, your gospel and the gift of your son with those in our community here and around the world. Father, we want to bring a couple of our family members that are and friends that are on our hearts, especially tonight. We want to give you thanks, Father, for the progress and the successful surgery uh, that Clay had. We give you thanks for the encouraging day that, uh, that they've had. And we just ask, Father, that you continue to be with that family. You give them strength. You use us, Father, to reach out and encourage them. 
we pray for healing. Uh, we pray for an increase in faith and that that love we all have for each other shows through our, our deeds and our aid to the Wiggingtons. Father, we also pray a prayer of thanks that Sherry is near complete with her cancer treatments. We're thankful that uh, they haven't uh, been intrusive into her life any more than they have been. We do ask, Father, that those treatments might be successful and, and accomplish their intended purpose and in eliminating the, the brain cancer that she suffered from. Pray for strength. Uh, we pray for comfort. And Father, we just pray for perseverance as we continue through this life. Father, we ask that you be with us tonight as we study from your word. We give you thanks for that word and your preservation of it. We ask that you be with us as teachers and as students, that we all continue to be good students of your word and we continue to learn throughout our lives on this earth. Thank you for Jesus, Father. Forgive us when we fail you. We pray through Christ. Amen. Amen. So um, before we get into class tonight, we do have uh, some things we want to cover. Um, it'll take just a few minutes. First off, uh, I want to again thank everybody uh, for all the encouragement you give to Robert and I both. Uh, it's, it's just really fantastic to, to be able to be in here each week uh, trying to facilitate a discussion and hearing so many people just say so many nice things to us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, we struggle to, to, to feel like we, we deserve it at all. But uh, we, do, we do appreciate it, and it, it energizes us and, and keeps us wanting to come back every week. Um, as you guys know, we talked about last week, we've only got, after tonight, we've only got three more classes, and we're only about halfway through uh, the book of Matthew. And uh, several people had asked us about doing, uh, continuing on into next quarter, and Robert and I did start discussing that, and then we realized that summer series uh, starts this summer. So we are not able uh, to do a follow-on quarter immediately. But uh, I, th I think I can say this. We asked the education committee if we could delay and do a Matthew part two in the fall. And as of right now, everybody on the education committee, we haven't heard anything uh, negative back. So tentatively right now, we're going to say we will do Matthew part two, Robert and I again, uh, in the fall, and we will cover the second uh, half uh, of the book. Uh, so we certainly welcome everybody that's in here back uh, to that class, and I want to issue a challenge to you guys, and that is you've been very participatory uh, up to now, and between now and the fall, just read the rest of the book, okay? And as you read the book, uh, if you have things uh, that are our questions, and, and this is honestly, uh, we'll talk about this some tonight. This is how I prepare for the class. I read it, and where I have to go, wait, wait a second, what does that mean? I'll usually jot something down and then go back and do deeper study. Our, uh, as you know, our theme for the year has been prayer and Bible study. So I'm asking you to take part in some of that Bible study on your own. So between now and the end, or, or now in the fall quarter, I'd ask, uh, read the rest of the book of Matthew, Take some notes, and where you have questions, or if there are things you want to dig deeper on, send them to Robert and I so that we can prepare uh, for uh, that second half uh, of, of Matthew that we'll be doing in the fall. Anything you want to follow up there? Nope. We gave them fair warning. Yeah, we did. We did. So um, we will do just a, you know, a bit of review. We are going to finish out uh, chapter 13. Uh, we are going to do a little bit of review because as we were, we were talking just before uh, class tonight, we are going to do some, some point backs uh, to, to uh, the beginning of the chapter. Uh, but chapter 13 was where uh, Jesus uh, started talking uh, in parables and he started uh, teaching uh, in parables. Um, and I remembered... For those of you that were there last week, uh, I remembered why I said it was interesting that he started with sowing, and we'll get back to that uh, as we close out um, the chapter tonight. So the first uh, parable we looked at uh, was the sower. That was in verses 1 through 9. Um, we talked about the purpose, uh, purposes uh, of the parables, and we talked about how uh, he was speaking in these parables, 
And the disciples ask him, you know, hey, why are you doing this? And he, he explained that to them. I want to go ahead. We talked about uh, the sower. We talked also about um, what evangelism looks like and how effective that is and how many times you have to... Yeah, and let me, I, let me stop myself. I was going to say how many times you have to be rejected, but it's not you being rejected. It's, it's the Lord being rejected if, if somebody rejects uh, the Word. We talk about you know, how, how, how many people you have to, to interact with. We talked about how it's uh, sowing and not gardening. We had the example of, of how uh, evangelism looks, and we talked to a couple of people in the class uh, about evangelism, uh, or about how they uh, came to know the truth. Um, and then, uh, and we'll get back to this tonight, I was telling Robert, and this is again one of the fun things about teaching this class with Robert, is when he started out and he said, we're going back to the Old Testament, I was like, what is he doing? But then he had the wonderful example of Nathan approaching David, uh, and we talked about how to approach people uh, and how to talk to them, and Siegfried shared uh, some additional thoughts there on the way uh, he has to approach people in a very difficult situation there uh, in the prison. Uh, and that's how we got into uh, then the parables and why parables. You want to jump in? You did a good job. All right. Any questions that lingered from last week? I think we got through the, the sower adequately. So do we want to go ahead and pick up with the the tears for yes. tonight. So we're going to start in verse 24. You yes. want to, okay. And I was going to say, let's talk about just a few things before we read it. I think it's important that we read it so it's crisp on our minds. Um, this again is a parable similar to the sower where in verses 24 through 30, uh, we hear the parable and then a few verses later, uh, it gets explained. Uh, sometimes this is called the, the wheat and the tares, sometimes wheat and the weeds. Uh, do we know what tares are? I think we just mentally make the connection to weeds, and, and that's our a lot of times our best understanding. But a little more information, it, it's important to realize that the tares here they're talking about are they're not good. They're actually bitter. Uh, I've read some are intoxicating, can be a hallucinogenic or even a poison type of grain. But the interesting thing about them is, and we need to keep in, in context as we read, they very closely resemble the wheat at the early phases. In fact, it's not until, and we'll read that, not until they start to produce fruit or grain that they're, it's easy to tell them apart. So we'll talk through some of the details of that, but just to kind of set the stage and have that in mind as we read the parable. Okay, we want to read it. Does anybody want to volunteer to read verses 24 through 30? Nice and loud, so everybody yeah, online can I'm staying close to you again. I'm not. <laughs> Roger's going to read it. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay. So, kind of like we've been doing, what's, what's this parable mean? What do we take away from that? We are. We can't be just completely broken apart. 
part, and then we don't, our mission is gone. Right. What else? Anybody else have any thoughts there? Who said that? All the way back there. Basically explaining the day of judgment. Also correct? Any other thoughts? He's talking about the kingdom. So, uh, he's evidently saying that uh, not everybody that appears to be in the kingdom might be, some of them might be weeds that will be weeded out. Also, also very, very, very true. Very good. Any other thoughts? I think it's also kind of tells you that uh, you you may be Christian, but you're going to live and have to deal with uh, people that are not Christians, and that you're going to have to uh, keep pure and and keep being the weed and and not uh, look uh, more start looking more like the, the weeds. Uh, I think. Uh, one thing I was reading was that uh, this weed and the wheat look very similar, so uh, it's kind of hard to tell just looking at them. So this may be uh, like uh, you may be you may be looking at somebody and think they're a Christian or a follower of God, and they're really a follower of the devil. Very true. So, so let me ask. Uh, let me ask a, another question. Then I'll. I'm, I'm going to kind of ask some questions, and then I'll, I'll share with you what 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 my thoughts were. And do you have something you want to jump in there? No, I, I didn't know at what point you would want to read the explanation. You, you want to get some thoughts out. I want to do that. do thoughts, and then we'll. I, I was planning on just hitting it as we as we go through the text. If that's or do you want to jump that's down right. to the? Okay. Uh, as you can see, we don't do coordination beforehand. So I told you we do we do a discussion here. So um, the uh, as Ed uh, said, so and and someone else said it. We're in living among the weeds, right? The 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 good uh, the wheat and the weeds are in uh, living uh, amongst each other. Now the servants, right? The servants here. What were they able to do? What were the servants able to do? They were able to what? They, they were able to tell the weeds from, from the wheat, right? So they were, they were able to discern what it was. Now, do you have something else you want to say? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, go ahead. Go go ahead. ahead. I'm from Oklahoma. There's a lot of wheat and barley and stuff growing there. And when the wheat comes up, it's just... Back when it's two or three inches tall, you think you could think it was someone's yard, other than it's in little bitty rows. But it all comes up as green. But uh, May, when the wheat starts to ripen, it's all brown or golden color, right? And the weeds are still green. So it's immediate. It's it's completely obvious what the weeds are at harvest time because the wheat has turned brown and and the, the weeds are still green. Yeah. But before that happens, it's not so easy. Yeah, I think absolutely. that's absolutely <laughs> applicable. For sharing that, yeah, yeah, absolutely applicable to what we were talking about. Um so 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 yeah, so the servants, right, they're able to see the difference in the weeds and the wheat. And do you remember what I was talking about last week? It seemed to me like um, in the chapter 12, we had a couple of instances with, with do y'all remember what I said the people were doing? What were they doing? The, the, in chapter 12, people were saying, look, look, look they're, they're not doing what's right. Hey, Jesus, they're not doing what's right. And we're, we're, we're back to kind of the, Kind of the same thing, okay? And so I, I'm going somewhere with this. So the, so the servants can tell the difference between the wheat uh, and the, the, the wheat and the, I want to say chaff, but the tares or the weeds. They can, they can tell the difference. But from the rest of the parable, is it the servant's job to separate those out? You 
You got a 50-50 chance on this one. Not yet. Fair, fair enough, fair enough. Not yet. I would say no. Whose job is it going to be to separate the wheat from the chaff? says it right there in the parable. The reapers. But under whose authority are they going to be working? The master, right? It says, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the weeds and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And the reason I thought it was, was interesting that he started... Uh, last week with the parable of the sowers, and I think we're going to see this continued throughout the different parables. He starts and he tells people, he tells them what? You go sow. You go spread the word. And then I feel like this, uh, then he gets down to this parable and he's saying, you go sow. And yet, some good is going to happen. There's going to be fruit produced but they're still going to be bad. And he essentially says, you don't, you don't worry about the bad. I will take care of that. I will take care of that. That's, that's what I take away from it. If you remember the example that I used last week, I think a lot of times when we um, as Christians are, are looking at evangelism or trying to evangelize, we get discouraged when we don't see that growth immediately or, or we don't see the result that we expect to see. And I think... Uh, this particular parable, he's, he is saying, don't you worry about that. When the harvest comes, I will be the one that takes care of that. Don't, don't you worry about that. Any, any thoughts there? Oh, that's good. I've, I've got some other questions in detail, I think, that we'll talk after we read through the explanation. So the weeds also get watered. Yes. And cultivated. Until it's obvious, the weeds. Back then, they didn't have commercial agriculture. Every little grain was precious. Trying to go after the bad immediately when you think it's bad, you can do a lot of harm. So, just wait. Yeah. In due time. And and Robert, now that I look at the clock, I think we probably should jump to the explanation. <laughs> and and. We can cover further next week. We can do another parable next week. Okay. So, since we're going to have. Yeah. Since we've got time now. Fall, yeah, we yeah. don't have to rush. A couple of thoughts that I found interesting. And you're going to see this, this common thing. Most of these parables start with the kingdom of heaven is like. And what did we say a good definition of a parable was? In the, the Greek, it means to, to lay alongside of for comparison. So here we see him saying that. And the interesting thing about the sower, when he started the parable, he didn't say that. But he said it in his, in his explanation of what it meant. Uh, interesting. And then when you get to this one, it's different. He starts the parable off with that. And before we read the explanation, did the disciples understand this parable when they heard it? He explained it because they said, hey, what you said back there, what, what, what did you mean? What does that mean? So no, they did not understand it when they heard it the first time. That's kind of interesting because he teaches in parables for a real life, relatable experience to bring it home to the individual person. Let's go ahead and read, and then we'll catch some of the structure that's, that comes out of that explanation. If you're... Yeah. I'll read it. 36 through 43. Beginning in 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. I want to come back and touch on that. Got some questions for you guys there. And the good seed <clears throat> is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest 
is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So to set the structure, he, he lays this out really clear. So the good seed, who's sowing that? I mean, let's just walk through it. It helps us remember. Who's sowing the good seed here? Which is who? Which is Jesus. And what or who is the field? And I, I worded that intentionally that way. The world. He says the world. What does he mean by the world, do you think? Have you thought about that when you read it? It's easy to generalize and think. Mankind. Mankind. I don't know that if it's the same root uh, in the Greek. I don't. And this was just a curiosity that I had because he talks about the world as he goes through this. And uh, let me find a verse that I found interesting. So the, the way we are thinking about the world is the world as a whole, right? Is that what we're saying? every human that lives in the world. And then somebody read loud verse 41. I'll read it. The Son of Man will send forth His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling box and those who commit lawlessness. So problem. where are the angels doing their gathering according to this verse? Out of his kingdom. I found that interesting. Do you see any issues or anybody ever question what does the world mean there? And I'm asking this some of the things I study, people have different opinions. Uh, I agree with that definition of the world, but it's interesting that when they come to do the gathering, they do it out of the kingdom. And notice how that's worded. It's not gather all the evil ones, all the evil people. The version that I have here with me says, gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. Does anybody have a different version? The stumbling blocks. I just thought that was interesting. you have any thoughts, David? Uh, were you going to answer that? I, no, I'm. I missed that. I mean, now that you say it, I'm like, yeah, I. I don't have a thought there. <laughs> this version says in the uh, Christian Standard Bible it says, and uh, gather all who call it, then and those guilty of all. All who pointing toward ind individuals or, yeah. I I think we can assuredly. It, it's all those people or souls that that are uh, evil, so to speak, and that, that cause or try to influence or tempt others, uh, I think is what it's referring to. But the, the fact that he's talking about the world, and I think we generally assume off the bat that it, it's everybody in the world, and then he talks about from the kingdom. And another thought to follow on with that, I'm getting way ahead in my notes, I'll turn it back over to you after this thought, David. I'll let y'all chew on this one. We talked about the kingdom of heaven. We talked about gathering out of his kingdom. And then after the judgment and the separation, what happens to the righteous in verse 43? 
Somebody read that. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. And where will they shine? Kingdom what? Kingdom of their father. Kingdom of their father. A, a little different verbiage there in that reference. Um, so when we read the word kingdom, our mind may automatically go to one typical definition. And, and I think we need to, to think and probably study more. I don't have all the answers, but I just I found that very interesting. And with all the interaction we've had in here, I thought there might be some good discussion. The split is appears to be a universal split, though. And the, the phrase, the, the wicked being cast where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, yes. is used in some other places than those other, in Matthew, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, in those places, I think it's talking about all of the wicked and what happens at the final judgment? All of the wicked as opposed to? Just the wicked being thrown out of the, out of the church, if you will. Okay. And, and that's kind of where I was. I think some people relate that and try to explain it as the church in the world. But I, I think, as you just stated, it, it's universal either way. Um, those that yeah, once we get to judgment, once it's harvest time, it's not man that's that's doing, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. not the servants that are doing the judging, because we're not, we're actually told not to do that. And he clearly says that it's going to be his angels that he yeah. sends to come do that gathering, that separating. And it's very clear, and I think very representative of what's going to happen to the the evil compared to the the righteous. So. Just some interesting things as you read through this. That, yeah, I, like I said, I I did not catch it that way. Now, I, I will say um, something that Robert pointed out a few weeks ago is something that has been uh, I, I keep kind of ruminating on it, and that was the verse that said, "I desire mercy and not sacrifice." I keep thinking about that, and then I've as you guys. Well, no, I've got this thread now where I feel like uh, as I'm reading it, the thread I'm seeing is uh, people wanting to judge, you know, again, saying, hey, see, see what's going on over there. And I want to spend a couple of minutes um, talking uh, about that. And I want to start with uh, a question. Is there a difference between sharing the truth and judging? Is there a difference between sharing the truth and judging? Anybody got any thoughts there? One is just telling the just arbitrary, just fact of the matter. One is asserting your uh, opinions about what should happen to you because of that. You're, you're, you're. It's the difference between you know stating the law and sentencing somebody in your eyes, you know, you, you are the one that's passing judgment, so to speak on somebody you're saying you deserve this or, uh, this thing should happen to you because you did X, Y, Z. Good. Yep. Any, any other thoughts there? I think truth is spoken out of conviction and judgment is not necessarily, it doesn't really have to do with your own conviction or feelings about something. It's just how you expect someone else to be convicted. The truth is your own passion for something speaking forth. I think that's that's true. Somebody over here have something to yeah, say? Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Pierces even to dividing of soul and spirit. Joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the intentions of life. We cannot do that because we can't discern those, but the word can. That's thank you for that. Thank you. Um, 
so then, so then, let me let me ask. Uh, um, I, I think some of y'all know where I'm going. So is this is this hard for us today? Is 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 sharing the truth and not judging, or is judging hard for? I want I want to hear some thoughts about that. Yeah. Well, if you were taught that you got to go yank that wheat out. That's what you assume would be necessary. But I think the comments you made, I didn't hear it. But it can be so disruptive and and destroy the roots and the, uh, you know, just if you go to notice, root, root out all these things that are grown, well planted together and all that, you know, you, you go pulling off some weeds and you just destroy the plant. You pull them both up. And, and it's, uh, I think this is a great example of how this parable works. Lay that out there, and anybody who might have been thinking along those lines, they just got to snatch all the weeds out. This guy's bad, this lady's bad, and if you want to transfer it into people. Um, the master here says, Nope, you just let them grow together. And you know, and, and obviously, the ones that are you know, nourished well, you know, and are somehow they, they're strong, they survive. And then at some point, you, you start pulling up the tears, and then everything's pulled up, and it's harvest time now. It doesn't matter. I mean, that, anyway, the point would be, no, that's not the kind of gardening God seems to do. You're just go to snatch up weeds. Yeah. So I think where my mind goes with this is is in today's society, if if we stand for the truth, sometimes what's the first thing that somebody will say? Don't what? Don't judge me, right? They say, don't judge me. But if we're just sharing the truth, are we judging them? No, we're not. And I thank you, Craig, for sharing uh, that vo- that verse because I think so many times, you know, if when, when we're if we're trying to judge, if we're being that servant that's saying, do, do you want me to go take care of that? The attitude we should have is if we, if there is a situation that needs to be remedied, rather than us calling somebody out, you present the scripture. You know, it's back to the example that Robert used last week when Nathan uh, confronted David. He didn't, you know, get in his face and wag his finger at him. He he kind of took him on a journey. And I always, I always uh, remember uh, there was an example that Stan shared used in a class years ago that his father. Somebody would come up to him and attempt to bait him into some sort of argument and would say, well, what about this? And Stan said his dad would silently pull out a Bible, flip to a page, and hand it to somebody and say, can you read verses you know, 5 through 10 there? And they would read it. And he said without fail, they'd close it back up, hand him back the Bible, and, and off they'd go. And so, um, you know, I think I think we live in a time right now in our world where there's a lot of division. There's a lot of people saying, don't judge me. And there's a lot, you know, and sometimes we don't handle that well. But don't deny the power of the word. We don't have to say anything. We don't. If we can show people uh, the truth, uh, the, the, the word will, will have, it has enough power of its own. It doesn't need us. And that's what I take away from, from last week through this parable. And I think we need to be, we need to keep that in mind. And we're going to see later when we get into the leaven and the mustard seed. Sometimes we get so caught up in the work that we think we need to do, we don't realize that the power comes from somewhere else. Okay? Yes, Siegfried. John 12, the context, Jesus said, I did not come to judge. I came to save, provide the means of salvation, spread. Verse 48, the word that I have spoken, it's already been said, nothing new. It will judge you in the final and the last day. The woman caught in the very act of adultery, the mob stirred up in their self-righteousness, accused. They judged because they wanted condemnation. 
And then Jesus asked, ultimately, of course, where are your accusers? Okay, I'm not going to just don't do it anymore because it is written. So he didn't judge. He didn't even accuse us. He said, just don't do it. Judgment ultimately will come. But whenever you go, like out there, out there, if I know that's a brother, I don't really go to him. So I'm in my mind already making a determination. Well, this guy's not living to what the word says. And therefore, I'm picking him, <coughs> not judging, but I know. And one thing that I emphasize all the time, please don't take my word. Don't listen to me. My <laughs> words will not judge you. Because on the day of judgment, they'll say, hey, Mr. Bill, chap, said this. No. I show them all the time because they're so quick to either judge, condemn, or whatever somebody else's stuff. No, that's, that's not me. It's interesting to me that... Um... The field here is full, is, is full, and there are two sowers. There is the, us sowing. You know, we had the responsibility to sow mm -hmm. from the first parable. Even though in this, the Son of Man, I think Correct. the proxy is, is us as well. But the field is full because there's another sower, the devil, and there are no blind spots in the field. You're either one or the yep. other. And to me, that is a, a big... It hits home to me because it says that the result of the the balance of wheat versus tares is as much up to me as it is anything else. We think about sowing in a field and the weeds just come in there. But in this in this instance, it's an activity by uh, Satan that puts them there. And we are responsible for as much as possible balancing that out and there's not a blank spot there's not and, and so if we and you talk about judging judging doesn't just happen after the, the the word has been presented we i've been guilty of it judging before planting the word you notice that in the parable of the sower the all the ground was covered right every type of ground yep. we don't get to pick which that's ground right we're gonna put. So, yeah. that's right um, thank y'all. Thank y'all for, you summed up the, the class perfectly for me. I want to leave y'all with one final thought. I wanted to make this fit and I couldn't make it fit, but this is something, uh, from goodness now, probably 40 years ago in my life. Uh, and I wanted to make it fit and I was trying to make it fit with judging and it's something I don't remember what I did. I don't remember what I did, but I was a little kid, uh, a little kid. I was probably a teenager. I don't remember what I did, but I remember my dad saying to me, I love you too much to let you act that way. And where that has gone for me, and what I was thinking about as I was preparing tonight and trying to make that fit in here about judging was my dad knew what was right, and he shared that with me and his heart was not because he was trying to call me out. His heart was because, in a very real sense, he wanted me to have a better life and to have it now. And I think the scripture says something about that as well. Um, but like I said, I just wanted to take the opportunity, since I've got a captive audience, I thought I'd share that with you. It doesn't necessarily fit uh, with tonight's lesson. Thank you all very much.